Welcome to this audio session recording taken at the Agroforestry Show, which was organised in September 2023 as a partnership between the Woodland Trust and the Soil Association. For more session recordings, go to agroforestryshow.com or explore and subscribe to the Agroforestry Show YouTube channel. Enjoy! Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session today, British Fruit Through Agroforestry. Um, it's great to see this event up and running. Um, I, was, I was on a Teams call over a year ago where we were looking at uh, starting this event, and it's so good to see everyone here. So, so a big warm welcome. Um, in this session, um, so I'm Jeff Newman. I, I work for Natural England. I'm the agroforestry lead for Natural England. Um, so I'm responsible for promoting agroforestry, um, looking at all the problems and also hopefully resolving them, and also promoting traditional orchards, uh, which is where my interest in fruit growing comes from. So um, it really is my pleasure to, to introduce three farmers today. We've got a really good range of different scales, of different perspectives, so um, please make the most of the session. We're going um, to have three sort of well, two presentations and a brief introduction, and then we're going to have a Q&A session. So please make the most of that, and please ask lots of questions, um, and, and have a think as we go through, because we'll have the panel at the end, so we'll have questions at the end, if that's okay. Um, so uh, in terms of introductions, firstly, we have Stephen Briggs. Stephen probably needs little introduction to most people here. He's uh, our modern-day agroforestry pioneer, I think, or, or at least one of them. And um, it's a real pleasure to have him here talking about his system, which is cereals and apples. And I will let him sort of talk the detail on that. Um, then we have Nathan Richards. Uh, Nathan's from Mid Wales. I won't try and pronounce your farm. I'll let you do that. West Wales, West Wales, West Wales. sorry. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and he's got a mixed sort of horticultural farm um, and has got, is innovating with fruit undercover. So really interesting to see how that mixes with a, a form of agroforestry. And then finally, we have Michael Bentley, um, who's an award-winning fruit uh, grower in, in Gloucestershire. Um, and it's great to have him here. He's, he's actually on my doorstep at home. So um, I collared him in because I, I, I've heard him speak before and I know he's good. So that's great. Um, so as I say, we're sort of going to have the two presentations, but we will have this Q&A panel. So please... Please do look at the challenges and the opportunities that agroforestry can offer you as a farmer, as a business, um, and how you might promote that if you're an advisor. Um, so, you know, how, how, do we, uh, how do we integrate fruit trees? How do, how do we make money? Um, I, I love that slide with the, with the pounds coming out of the blossom, the notes coming out of the blossom. I'm sure it's true for all you fruit growers out there. I'm sure it's that easy. Um, and, and, and if it's not, <laughs> you'll let us know. <laughs> so, I mean, did you know that we import 60% of our apples, at least 60% of our apples? Did you know that we, we import at least 80% of our pears? We, we grow good fruit in this country. Why is that the case? And that, that therefore must be an opportunity. But then if you look at the British fruit industry at the moment, it really is feeling the pinch of rising costs, um, lower returns... And it is struggling. Um, it's not that many months ago I saw some headlines about uh, fruit trees being grubbed up in Kent. Um, so, so there are definite challenges out there. And then, of course, there's the British weather. So I came thinking last week, right, OK, I'll have a nice pair of long trousers, a long shirt, maybe some Wellington boots, all that sort of thing. And here we are in glorious sunshine. Um, it's just so unpredictable at the moment. And that's not just British weather, is it? We're, we're probably at the lucky end in terms of what the, what the continent has experienced this year. So, so really, in a, clim in a changing climate, we really need to, to consider uh, you know, what, what, is, what is realistic and can we get consistency of product. Um, and then something close to my heart, the cider and peri. peri. I went to the uh, Craft Con conference this year on craft cider and peri. Um, fantastic vibe at that conference and it wasn't just the cider it was it was really good there's a really good burgeoning um, industry uh, around craft cider and it really is growing I know here at Eastbrook they're, they're growing peri pears um, and hoping to get a niche market for those I've got some at home so I'm biased I think, I think it's great product but 
yeah, those are, those are kind of the stats, really. Those are kind of... I mean, and the other thing you'll notice is where are we in the league table of, of worldwide producers for apples? And um, we're 31st, and we're below some notable countries that I wouldn't have thought we would be below. So um, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's like the Olympic Games and it's that bad, but, y you know, we, we, we probably could get a bit higher up that table, perhaps. Anyway, without further ado, I will hand over to Stephen, um, who, who, as I say, needs no introduction, and I will, I will let him take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, Jeff's asked me to give a, a bit of an overview of what we're doing on our own farm with the fruit and the agroforestry and where it all came from. Um, I wear a number of different hats with AHDB uh, Innovation for Agriculture and was very lucky to do a Nuffield Farming Scholarship on agroforestry some 13 years ago. Um, I farm a long way from here, at least it felt like a long way driving, um, uh, over in Cambridgeshire and uh, I put together just a whole bunch of sort of pictures of the farm to give you a sort of idea. But we're, we're over just on the edge of the fens uh, over in Peterborough just near Peterborough, 110 hectare farm. Uh, the majority of it is tenanted, and we've got half of the farm down to uh, agroforestry, so 52 hectares, sort of go big or go home back in 2009 when we set it up. We're, we're a local authority farm, uh, so Cambridge County Council. I'm a first generation farmer, um, and the uh, local authority has about 13,000 hectares, uh, of which we're one of those farms. Uh, and what got us into the whole idea of agroforestry initially, well, I, I trained as a soil scientist some 30-odd years ago when it was deeply unfashionable. Um, it's coming in quite handy now. Um, but um, when we took the farm on, we, we realised that our soils were frankly buggered uh, on a farm that we'd taken over. Um, the, the clay soils were what I would call minute soils. They went from being porridge one minute to concrete the next minute uh, and our lighter soils literally blew away when they were left bare. So we, we took on the farm back in 2007. Uh, we wanted to take a farm which had a greater sort of multifunctional land use. So instead of just growing wheat, potatoes and sugar beet, we wanted a, a broader array of products. We wanted to uh, spread our, our, our enterprise diversity, protect our soils, create markets and, and create biodiversity and habitat. And, and agroforestry seemed to be the, um, the logical approach, something I'd seen in, the, in working in Africa, but, but hadn't seen much of it here in the UK. Uh, and uh, in 2009, we put in a 52 hectare uh, agroforestry system based on a density of 85 trees per hectare spread across the landscape. Um, our limitations were that we're, we're, we're tenant farmers, so we had to we had to get an economic return within the the period of our tenancy, which was 15 years at the time. We needed to retain common agricultural eligibility. Uh, we needed uh, we had limited capital, small pockets, and it needed to be profitable. You know, we had to pay the rent. So we decided that fruit was the right thing for us because we could we could uh, enter a market that um, that was. As, as Jeff has just said, slightly untapped. We knew that fruit was growing 15, 20 miles away from us on a large commercial scale, but nothing locally. So we knew things would grow, uh, and we needed to create that, that system and those markets. So we set about putting, uh, back in 2009, putting uh, uh, an alley cropping agroforestry system in based on uh, three metres between each tree, a three metre understory uh, pollen nectar strip, and then a 24 metre working alley between each uh, between each row of cre trees, leaving a sort of 27 between centres. Uh, and that's sort of what it looked like. Lots of sticks in the ground for a few years. Um, all our fields are sort of regular shaped. Um, and because of our local drainage um, laws, <laughs> we had to leave uh, 24 metre turning uh, uh, access at, at the end of every, every row for cleaning out drainage ditches, and that allowed us to, to move in with machinery. So back in 2007, we planted uh, 4,500 trees, 
Uh, Two-year-old feather maidens all went in in sort of October, November uh, with a, a, a machine post, a bamboo cane, uh, a, a mulch mat and a, and a guard. Um, but why did, we, why did we pick fruit? Why are we here talking about fruit? Well, why apples? Uh, why not other fruits? Um, we, we contemplated with pears, we contemplated with cherries, we contemplated with nuts. Ultimately, it was about where we saw a market, um, how we could introduce uh, complexity into our system, but, but retain a level of control. We knew that fruit would grow locally. We knew there was processing locally. We knew there was a market opportunity. Um, so it was a partly about local conditions, partly about pest and disease knowns and unknowns. But we, we also needed that economic return within the period of our tenancy, uh, 15 years. And um, so waiting for a nut fruit crop, which might have taken much longer, probably wasn't, wasn't, wasn't possible. So partly about land, t land tenure, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The other complicator is that in, in and around all these fruit trees, we're growing cereal crops. So we have to get the timing right. So we harvest our cereals and then go back and harvest autumn fruit. Whereas cherries were going to be early, uh, ready much too early in the season and, and we'd, have a, we'd have a conflict with the, the cereals. Um, so, so there was lots of, I'd describe this as sort of three dimensional chess wearing a blindfold. Uh, and, um, and, and there are lots of complicating bits of the jigsaw we need to sort of pick together. So we decided on, on apples and fruit. Um, uh, we looked at different rootstocks and vigour. Uh, we ended up with a 109 M109 semi-dwarf. Uh, we, we thought about pest and disease tolerance locally, scab tolerance, uh, local soil conditions. Um, and, and really, we wanted a fairly low input, easy care type of system, so not an intensive type of system. And we wanted some for eating and some for juicing, so uh, sort of multifunctional. And as I've already mentioned, picking, not early varieties. Having something ready in August was no good to us because we still had cereals to harvest. So we ended up with, with a whole bunch of varieties. Some you'll recognize, perhaps some you won't. About half of those varieties are heritage and about half of them are, are modern varieties. Um, we went into this as, I suppose, complete fruit virgins. We had no idea what we were doing. Um, and we took lots of advice from, from uh, nursery growers. And I would say that the, the lower half of that list, the, um, the um, uh, heritage varieties from sort of russet down, they, they're all consistent, give us relatively modest but consistent yields year in, year out. All the top of the list, the modern varieties, they're, they're very much sort of waxing and waning. They give us a good yield one year, nothing the next year, they, yeah, and they're very much more sensitive to, um, to sort of uh, climatic conditions, wet and, wet and hot years. So come 2009, just to flip through on, on some slides to give you a visual, we planted all these trees, got the kids involved, uh, from the local school, I thought they'd come back and be pickers, you know. They're all, they're all about, you know, sort of 18, 20 now, those kids. There's no mobile re phone reception in the middle of the field, so they're not interested, you know. But, but it, was a, it, was, it was a vain hope. We planted the trees, had the coldest winter in 15 years, and then the driest spring in 30 years. So they had a baptism of fire. Uh, but they have all grown, and we only lost about 5% of the trees from, from sort of death, which I was quite comfortable with. Um, all the understories got sown with a sort of pollen and nectar mixture. Some, some of those mixtures did better than others. Um, and, and that's more sort of what the farm looks like today. So what was a large open landscape has a polyculture of cereals and fruit trees growing together. The area isn't devoid of trees, but what we've done is reintroduced trees, but in a more linear sort of uh, a feature so that we can, we can use modern machinery. And, and so we're, we're growing a, a 24 metre alley crop of cereals uh, with, a, with a fruit crop that's then got a, um, uh, an understory of pollen and nectar. And we also have a, a bee business as well, uh, rearing, um, rearing colonies of bees, which then help, help pollinate. So that gives you sort of a, a few pictures of what the farm looks like. Um, I'm the one that plants the cereals and drives the combine, so I have to make sure that apple trees don't go through a combine harvester because that doesn't tend to work very well. Um, but the bit that got us really interested in this to start with, and this, this illustrates it quite well, 
uh, you've got two crops in that field at that point in time. You've got an oak crop and a, and a fruit crop. And the oak crop there has stopped photosynthesizing. And if you think that as a, as a farmer or a forester, whether I'm growing fruit or vegetables or cereals, we're all in the same game. We, we harvest sunlight and we turn that into product. And there are periods in the year whereby we turn the solar panels off. If we can keep the solar panels turned on, 365, we get more energy and more productivity into our system. So all we've tried to do with, this, with our agroforestry concept is keep the solar panels turned on and also, I'm a tenant, I pay rent. If I can make the farm bigger by growing three-dimensionally above and below <laughs> ground, I don't pay any more rent, but I use more space. So I make the farm bigger, harvest more sunlight, and make it more productive. We've worked a lot with uh, uh, academic institutions. We're not a research farm. We currently have about four or five PhD and MSCs gathering data for us. We know from the data that we've got more beneficial insects because effectively we've created regular refuges across a large open landscape. That helps with pest and disease control. Um, we've got more of the beneficials, less of the, uh, the, 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 the nasties. We know that through the published papers that we've got more spiders, birds, beetles, 200% more solitary bees and hoverflies, 240% more bumblebee, bumblebees, and a 10 times increase in species richness, because we've increased lots of the edge effect across the landscape. There are some, some sort of unknowns um, we, or, or some, some unseen benefits. By creating an agroforestry alley cropping system, we actually created a controlled traffic farming system. So all our alleys now have all our machinery is migrated for the cereals into six metre machinery, six metre cultivators, six metre uh, sowing equipment, six metre harvesting equipment, uh, which means we're only treading in the same place so we've effectively created a, uh, a controlled traffic farming system de facto. Um, that also led us into thinking further about three-dimensional cropping. So now we have the trees at one level, we have the cereals at another level, and we companion plant all our cereals with a, with a clover or a legume as well. So we've got a three-tier stacked system in space, but also in time, time to harvest that sunlight. <clears throat> so, uh, on, the, on the cereal side, we grow specialist organic gluten-free certified products. Um, so we're stacking our, our, our premiums as much as we can. Um, and back in 2019, uh, a couple of years ago, I remember we had about three days of severe 60-mile-an-hour uh, winds in the middle of August when we were ready to harvest our cereals. And in the open fields without the cereals, we probably lost about 20% of our grain crop because it just threshed itself in the field and ended up on the floor. A bit difficult to pick it up. In the fields with agroforestry, we only lost about 5%. So we, 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 we halved our losses uh, because the trees were cutting down um, wind speed at, uh, at, at, at sort of ground level and therefore reducing those losses and that, that damage. So part of the rationale for the agroforestry was really about microclimate. It was about cutting down wind speed, about making it warmer in the autumn, cooler in the summer, um, uh, uh, managing water loss and evapotranspiration, etc. And we were expecting for many years to see our alleys having bigger crops in the middle of the alleys and then as we get towards the tree lines at the edges, having, having lower crops because of the competition that everyone said would happen from the trees. Well, 15 years in, we're seeing the reverse. We're seeing more crop at the edge, just adjacent to the trees. Now, these are relatively small trees. Uh, you can see that they're, they're sort of about three, four meters tall. We want to be able to pick off these, so they're effectively windbreak hedges. Um, but we're seeing more crop nearer the edge, and you, you know, I know this because I drive the combine, I have to tilt the header because the crops are bigger and near the edge. And this is partly because we're getting better drainage in the winter, partly because we're getting a bit of moisture retention from wind and evapotranspiration in the summer, and partly we know from the research from, the, from Reading is that we've got a much higher mycorrhizal 
uh, association across these, these rows closer to the trees. So we're harnessing uh, microclimate and we're harnessing the power of nature in terms of those below ground mycorrhizal uh, beneficial fungi relationships. And that's what's giving us the, the sort of the bounce in terms of uh, um, product, productivity and resilience. So there's really good forestry data on tree growth and economic data. There's really good data from AHDB on, on cereals, uh, for example, or grass growth. There's not a lot of really good information on agroforestry because there's not that many of us yet doing it. The Agroforestry Handbook was a good step forward in that, and I'm sure there's information about that here today. But what we've, we've effectively taken is a, is a mixed system or a hybrid system of mixing a traditional fruit crop with a cereal crop to create a, a, a more resilient system. And to put some numbers on it, um, our, our oats, which are grown organically, uh, we're making gross margins of about £1,600 a hectare. Uh, our fruit, our wheat is slightly lower than that, and our fruit is slightly higher than that. Bear in mind that of that 52 hectares, with 4,500 fruit trees, we're only got 8% of the land area under trees. 92% is still doing cereals. So we're really spreading our risk. I could have put 4,500 fruit trees on four hectares, yeah, put them all in one field, but then I'd have a, a microclimate with high disease pressure, high management pressure, etc. By spreading them out across the landscape, I get all the co-benefits of diversity, ecology, soil protection, etc. And I get, I haven't put a spray uh, or, or any kind of pest or disease management into those trees in 15 years. Not, not that we're, we're without losses. Um, I said we lost 5% from death. We had quite a lot of damage from hares. We had quite a lot of damage from pigeons. Nobody told me we were putting in 4,500 roosting posts for pigeons. <laughs> I solved it by putting 10-foot bamboo canes in with the trees, and then the pigeons would land on the bamboo canes. Now the trees are bigger, it's not an issue. So... One of the primary drivers here was what do we do with four and a half thousand trees and some fruit? Yeah, I could sell it wholesale, but as Michael, I'm sure, will tell us in a minute, that that's a pretty low margin gain. If you look at uh, where the value added is in the food chain in the UK, the little light blue line at the bottom, I'm afraid it's a bit bright in here, but that's that's the that's the share that growers and farmers get. As growers and farmers, we get about but in 1988, it was about 11%. Today, it's between 7.6 and 9.4% of the food chain value at the farm gate. Uh, everything above that in orange and grey and yellow and, and blue is either food manufacturing, wholesaling, retailing, or catering. So everybody else is making the money. And I was determined not to be in that category. So we, we, we took all our fruit, uh, and we either sell it uh, as fresh fruit a small percentage but about 90% goes into a bottle and on the back of this business we built a farm shop uh, so we've got four and a half thousand square foot of retail and we now uh, uh, retail, retail about 5,000 bottles of fruit juice a year and capture all that value so you can take five five grams worth of fruit and turn it into 15 grams worth of fruit juice um, uh, and it's got a longer shelf life and capture all that value so that was critical I think the one bit that I did miss just to sort of wrap up, um, when we planted the trees 15 years ago, I was quite interested. I got and talked to quite a lot of big corporates to see if they would fund any of this activity of tree planting because it seemed like a really sensible thing to do and they might be able to get a biodiversity or a carbon credit or offset uh, through their corporate social responsibility. And needless to say, I've got a lot of shut doors and a lot of phones put down on me and not much interest. But I think today we're in a very different place uh, and even some more recent work by the FAO, Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN in 2020, looked at a range of options for carbon and biodiversity again, and agroforestry scores really, really well uh, against quite a lot of other, uh, other land uses. So there's a massive opportunity for us as agroforesters, uh, perhaps, to think about where the opportunities are for uh, 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And if we look at where we rank around the world, it's a bit like the fruit story. We're, we're, we're down the bottom of the could do better list. Uh, and we know we're, we're capturing about four and a half tons of carbon per year with our fruit trees. Uh, if I could get 30 pounds per CO2 equivalent, that would be yeah, sub 100 or just over 100 pounds a hectare additional income, which would make a difference to me. Um, we're not there yet. Um, I think it'll come. Um, soil carbon isn't on the balance sheet of any of our agricultural textbooks and costing books. It should be. Um, and I think, um, I think that's an opportunity for us. Uh, but whatever we do, um, uh, for certain that uh, as farmers, we're really good at innovating and adapting. Agroforestry is part of that innovation and adaption, and that will be key to our future in terms of market, economics, climate, uh, uh, farming systems, etc. And, and so um, I, I hope you have a great, great day here today and tomorrow. And, and learn as much as you can about agroforestry and happy to take some questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I'll hand over now to Nathan. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nathan Richards, and I, along with my wife, Alicia Miller, uh, farm on a very, very different scale, uh, Troy de Hu Farm in uh, Fluindavith, Ceredigion. Um, we are essentially a mixed horticultural unit, uh, which has also taken to uh, producing some fruit, and we also keep a, a small number of, uh, of cattle as part of our, uh, part, of, part of our land use. We keep uh, a small herd of highlands or fold of highland uh, cows. Uh, our farm is on the Keradigian coast. Uh, we are eight and a half hectares, so about 23 acres. Um, and it's uh, certified mixed organic production, uh, a vast amount of, of vegetables, which we do all, uh, we sell all of that as direct marketed. So we uh, run a, uh, a vegetable box scheme which runs up and down the Keradigian coast and also uh, into North Pembrokeshire and slightly into Carmarthenshire. And we're currently doing about 120 veg boxes a week, plus they do a single, uh, uh, a single uh, farmer's market in North Pembrokeshire every Monday. And we're really essentially involved in what I call it a hyper-local business. So we grow it or we deliver it or uh, we sell it all and, um, and then we go to sleep. Um, we, uh, 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 that's pretty much what we do. Uh, the farm ethos, I'll just flick through some of, the, some of our slides as you go so you get a, just a, an overall picture of our farm and the diversity of our farm. And what my, what my overarching ethos is, is to have as diverse a unit as possible. I'm really interested in thinking about the greater ecology of the farm, not only uh, feeding human beings, but very much about everything else that we share that land with, and still running a viable, um, a viable vegetable farm. Uh, which produces also a considerable amount of, 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 of fruit on a small scale. This is all about seasonality as well. So what we're doing is that we're producing food um, um, uh, um, that should be eaten within the season when we can produce it. Um, as far as amounts, so uh, holding is 23 and a half acres, of which 15 acres... Uh, uh, 15 acres is in um, horticultural rotation, which means that we produce off of about 12 acres of uh, 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 vegetables every year. That includes polytunnels and also our top fruit out, on the, out, out in one of our fields. Um, I should tell you a little about our location. So we really are on the Keradigian coast. We're about a mile and a quarter from the sea. Uh, three months of the year, I would say that we live on Cardigan Bay. Um, the rest of the year, we live on the Irish Sea. It is seriously windy site. It's, a, it's an incredibly windy site. But, and I'm afraid I don't think I've covered this particularly well in my slides. Well, maybe there's one or two in here that you might get a sense of. We've kept very high hedges and very wide hedges across the farm. And our, our largest field is four and a half, uh, four and a half acre field. So 
we've, we've embraced having natural windbreaks. We've embraced having very li large beetle banks and predator belts. And that is part of the way that, w that, w that we've continued to farm there. Um, the, uh, one of the issues about being such a small farm is often labour. It's very much a small family farm. It incorporates myself and my wife. My wife uh, runs the diverse part of our business because we also have, we've converted old farm buildings into, uh, we have a couple of holiday cottages on the farm. So we're super diverse in that way. She also runs the box scheme. And then it's myself producing vegetables along with my daughter, who I'm about, who's in the slide there, um, uh, who's about, who I'm about to lose to, uh, off to university, and I have one full-time worker. We then have a, uh, a packer and a delivery driver, and I also live with woofers all year round, so we have between one and four woofers living with us within our, within our house. And it's, so it's a very nice community. It's very much based about food and good eating and all of those things. And supplying super locally vegetables, very good quality vegetables, uh, um, really within our own neighbourhood. The reason I'm obviously here today, though, is to talk about fruit. And so I shall just move on to the thrust of what we're, we're doing. Sorry, uh, just a picture of my box scheme. And uh, our farmer's market, when it's not running, one of the things I feel very much committed to is to make sure that we're a viable option always. Uh, what we've noticed is that people eat all year round and we can produce food all year round. So even when the farmer's market is closed, we'll turn up um, and uh, park the van up and pull, the, pull a bench out or a surfboard or something. And do you know what? The local spa now hold us a place because they know that it's good for business if we turn up every week. When quite early on, we had a lot of kickback about, oh, being a farmer's market here, it's going to put pressure on the businesses. Tell you what, those local cafes and shops are pretty annoyed if it, when the market councils the, these days because it brings a lot of people into a small town. And I think it's really fantastic that we're able to to uh, feed that local community. It's a small local community. It's a very small town. However, we see our summer, uh, our summer numbers rise massively as we uh, benefit from tourism into our area. And so we're in that lucky position where with box schemes which tend to drop in numbers over summer months, we actually see a massive rise as we have people coming into the area and faced with Sparrow Londis. We are often ask where the nearest Waitrose is and I can point them back 120 miles to, for their round trip. Um, so, we do, so we do all right out of that. Um, a final picture here um, of some top fruit growing out in one of our fields. Uh, one of our fields which we actually have done some, some uh, experiments with. When we first arrived, I decided to put in a top fruit orchard with some soft fruit as well. Um, and because of our location, we put everything on vigorous rootstock. I wanted big, large trees which might survive um, the gales that we have, um, uh, the, 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 the quite difficult soil conditions that we have. And I think we planted in 2010, and we now have a lovely apple orchard, which works really well for us, and we're currently harvesting apples, which will be sold directly. They will be sold on my farmer's market or they'll go into our extra large or large vegetable boxes each week. And we'll be in those for several months. Uh, I don't, yes, unfortunately, I've missed a slide. Um, but l lower down in the field, we have uh, planted uh, road uh, soft fruit. So we've everything, uh, we started with gooseberries, raspberries, uh, yoster berries. Um, in, large, uh, in large alleys, and then we just started to uh, experiment with growing in between in those alleys. Um, to some success, to some failure, uh, we tried uh, growing some heritage wheat, which was a disaster. We've actually brought vegetables into that uh, system this year, and it's worked incredibly well. So this, this year we've got uh, courgettes, sweet corn, beans, growing very, very well in those large alleys. And they're very easy for us to get in. We can get in with machinery. We do everything on fixed beds with a bed former um, on a 90 horsepower tractor. Um, we drill crops, we transplant crops, they all, and it all works quite well within those systems. But I shall move on to really why I'm here and uh, to talk about uh, agroforestry, but with a slightly different slant. Uh, we've become, let me put it this way, I have nine large polytunnels, and as a grower, using a rotation, I'm always in my polytunnels, and I'm in a similar 
space to this. And over the years, it's been really starting to nag at me that it's rare in our rotation that we get really high plants. We're regularly, so we have our cucumbers in one year, and we have French beans, which we grow inside, uh, and we grow tomatoes. But a huge amount of that time, we're growing salad crops down here, we're growing peppers up and aubergines up at this height, and there's all this space above. And I just started to think, particularly as we're seeing this warming trend, as climate change starts to be really apparent, whether I should start thinking about experimenting a little bit more with this space. Now, I'm working on a very small scale, and it is hugely experimental in, in many respects. I'm sure there are other people out there doing it, and I'd love to find them, because I found that quite difficult to research. But we just decided, or I talked to my wife, and we started to uh, think about putting in some stone fruit. I was really interested to see how stone, stone fruit might work within our um, within this protected environment and what the effect that would have on those crops which I'm totally reliant on those vegetable crops in the understory and whether they would have a ridiculous impact on those and that would become unviable so so we started on this uh, this adventure we started off planting an apricot and then a second apricot and then uh, then cherry trees now, cherries, we probably thought, well, we could grow those outside. I was personally concerned, having tried to grow raspberries where we are, um, that um, we have a blackbird population which has moved into the area and is probably one of the healthiest blackbird populations in Caradigan. I was, I was really thinking, I'm going to lose this fruit, and I don't have that kind of labour or infrastructure or money to have that infrastructure to cover this lot with netting or bird cages or any of those things. So I thought, right, I'll try them in the tunnels. Let's see how those are affected. Obviously, I didn't want to lose all of this space, so I had to then think about how I'm going to train these trees. So we looked at our largest tunnel. We have eight large tunnels. All our tunnels are around about 27 feet wide. Sorry, I'm old-fashioned. 27, 28 feet wide, about 90 feet long how could we best utilise that middle space? So we looked at our highest tunnel and thought, right, that's where we'll start. We'll put in a line of trees down the middle of the tunnel and, and here we go. Let's, let's, let's have a go. So 2018, 2019, we put in some, uh, some apricots and cherries. And then I started to kind of develop a fan training technique to try and bring the, the plants in. I think when I started off, I really kind of got it wrong. If I were to start again, I would probably improve my, uh, my pruning technique. But surprisingly, it started to pay off. So early on, we started to see, see lots, of, lots of blossom, and we started to actually start to watch these, these trees uh, progress. What might be interesting... One of the things which I've learned about growing in polytunnels is they're actually very difficult to photograph in, in polytunnels with a, with a phone to try and, particularly when you put a bloody great tree in the middle, uh, uh, um, uh, to, uh, to um, capture an image of the undergrowing crop. So when we first started, we do a rotation where we have at least part of our polytunnels, so we have one of a half a polytunnel in two years of uh, strawberry growth. So we, we were originally in, um, these were under, they had an undercrop of strawberries in its second year when they, when they went in. And that crop has changed throughout. So um, I'm hoping that as we go down, you'll start to see. So there's a, there's a nice slide coming up with a strawberry crop underneath, um, uh, growing at that point through my pegs, underneath those trees as they were developing. Where we've moved on to, we've now on, on that uh, left-hand bed. Now we've got some uh, some beetroot and some kohlrabi. And on the right-hand side, we were, had carrots and and some lettuces growing in this tunnel. We wanted to see what the effect was on those and how how that worked. It was really interesting. Shading didn't seem to be an issue. Quite regularly, if you get your if you think about when you're going to be harvesting things and you think about where the uh, where the crop is going to be against the uh, tree's blossoming cycle and its leaf cycle, you can actually time out, time out really quite well. 
Um, what we were also interested, or I was particularly interested in, is, is our nutrient loss, um, whether we would be uh, losing a lot of nutrient from, that, from the crop under sown. And we really haven't noticed anything. Only this year, as we came into a higher crop, I think we've got a slide now coming up, yeah, with, um, uh, with um, some salad, which is obviously at that point is running off to sea, but, uh, but then... Uh, broad beans following that. Um, we didn't really notice any particular uh, nutrient drop. Um, and it was interesting then watching these broad beans, for instance. I don't, I'm hoping that I've got a slide. Yeah, um, so our broad beans are in this, in this photograph on the other side there. Just absolutely amazing. They always do when you grow in, in a protected cropping environment. But... They haven't affected the trees. We haven't seen anything drop out of our broad bean crop. And um, it, was, it was just really quite exciting to, to follow this one through. Um, watering. So the way we've, uh, we've done that, we, we have a header and we have tea tape that runs through. We obviously want to make sure that our fruit, uh, our fruit is probably getting more than our vegetables, so there's been quite a lot of learning about how we, how we uh, measure the watering, so, so the water that's going into the trees, uh, so we get a lot more to the trees than to, uh, to some of the salad crops, uh, for instance, or the carrot crops. And there's uh, some of the produce uh, first, uh, first uh, starting to come. And all of this is so, sown, uh, this is, all of this is sold directly. Um, so all of these then sell directly off the farmer's market or the, uh, the, the, um, the, the into the box scheme. Another interest that I thought was something I wanted to think about with this was about stone fruit production is that our customers are still going to be eating stone fruit, whatever. I just thought it would be interesting to see whether this was a possibility, uh, particularly in our time of climate change and the huge amounts of food which is being imported. And I'm wondering if we can even have some, uh, some uh, impact on that. Um, I have to say that when I turned up at market uh, with 200 apricots, uh, they sold within about maybe 30 minutes. It was, a, it was, not, a, it was not for us a, a difficult sell, any of this. The fruit sells incredibly quickly. It's not a huge crop, but it's all part and parcel of everything else that is being sold. At the same time as we're sending that, we're sending a bunch of carrots, we're selling kohlrabis, we're selling, selling everything. They all go out together, so, which, was, which was quite exciting. Things that we've learned, um, uh, things that we're still learning. Uh, a lot about pruning, a lot of, uh, about varieties. One of the things that we, we experimented with early on, we did try um, some dwarf uh, rootstock. We've given up on that. I found that putting everything on St. Julian A was a really good idea and actually have really quite vigorous trees. Uh, it means that going up a ladder and making sure we're pruning out uh, so we're not uh, losing our polytunnel skins. I also need, need to know that I'm going to be able to re-skin those polytunnels with the, with the trees in there. So they were I obviously need to restrict them. Challenges for myself, um, I get rather excited by seeing quite a large crop of fruit. And actually, fruit selection is something new to me. You know, actually, we've been producing too much small fruit. And I actually need to be far harder with thinning on, on uh, 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 smaller fruit. However, that said, selling off bags of small peaches, apricots, has not been difficult. Everyone just comes and goes, yeah, that's fabulous. I, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, a Costa Caradigion, you know, I am the local man from Del Monte. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> it's an incredibly small scale. But I'm very interested with e experimentation. It's got to be seen within the wider aspect of, of what we do uh, farm-wise. Um, a couple of technical, really technical things, for instance, that we've learned. One, of the, one, of, one thing, particularly with apricots, um, so one of the things that we had to deal with is pollination. And when apricots are flowering, our pollinators aren't that active. Um, so we're really trying to work out how, how we could work that. So our, currently our polytunnels, we have netted ends. So we've got, uh, we've got good ventilation, but I can close the t tunnels down to warm it up a bit. But I need to know that our pollinators can, 
come in and out. I've got 14 beehives on the farm, but our honeybees aren't particularly active at that time. We've also tried hand pollinating, and we weren't particularly successful with that. Later, fruit, so the peaches and our nectarines got really well pollinated. Our uh, solitary bees were very, very active at that time, but we really noticed something with that. And so this is something I'm now discussing with our beekeeper, whether it's possible that we might bring an early colony in at, uh, at flowering point. But again, this is just really live and learn, just try, try things. Um, that's, that's my real interest. Um, yeah, airflow, ventilation through those tunnels. Again, it's, it's a learning curve where uh, you know, we, didn't, we didn't want to do this at the detriment of all of those other things, which essentially earn, it, earn our keep, if you like. For, for, you know, I, did, I didn't want to have 40 really good punnets of, uh, 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 of cherries and nothing else from that tunnel. That would be a disaster. What I want to have is 250 punnets of cherries and, you know, 5,000 bunches of carrots uh, 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 and, and 2,000 lettuces. That's where the, you know, it's, it's about that uh, diversity of, of our income as well. Anyway, that's really essentially what we've been trying. That's what my interest. It's a extreme learning curve, but to be honest, I think all of our farming is. Uh, um, I, I, I feel that across all of our fields every year. I've been doing it for quite a long while, and it's still an adventure every year. This is just uh, an addition to that adventure. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. That was uh, absolutely fascinating, really interesting. Um, and now hand over to Michael, who talk us through his fruit farming and give us give us lots of gems of wisdom I'm sure thank you uh, thank you Jeff um, so I'm at the other end of the scale I think I should say I'm a commercial fruit farmer I'm not organic uh, and I have to deal with the supermarkets and if there's anyone here from the supermarkets I apologize but uh, I don't recommend dealing with the supermarkets I don't recommend dealing with the wholesale trade uh, I'm uh, envious of uh, Nathan, what he's doing, dealing direct with the consumer, we do that as well, and Stephen who's adding value. And really my message today is about the issue of marketing. If anyone is here thinking about growing fruit associated with agroforestry, think very hard about your soil, your situation, and what your market might be because it's, it's a lovely thought just to go out on a day like today and pick fruit. But actually, today is the worst sort of day to pick. We're back home, we're picking pears now, and they're coming in at sort of 25 degrees, and we've got to get them down as quickly as possible to 4 degrees, and that's a lot of electricity. So I don't sleep very well at night hearing the fans going hour after hour trying to bring the temperature down. And that's what it's all about, is quality. If you're dealing with the wholesale or the supermarkets, they're just the same. They all want perfect fruit. And the problem is with apples, it, they, people buy with their eyes. They don't buy the taste. So if there's any blemish on it, they don't buy it. And it it's sounds silly to say, but survey after survey, people will say, oh, I don't mind, I want organic apples. But actually, if they've got coddling stings or... Um, scab on them, they don't buy them. That is fact, I'm sorry. Um, because we're dealing with farm shops, we have our own farm shop, and we deal, we supply to uh, high street farm shops uh, and the wholesale trade. So we have a broad experience of it. So I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart, think very carefully about what your market's going to be. Um, I found Stephen's um, talk very interesting because I was a cereal and arable farmer myself before I foolishly went into top fruit and plums. So we, we've got a 147 acre fruit farm uh, near Ledbury and um, we got, I'm going to mix my units now, 16 hectares, nearly 40 acres of plums which we've just finished and now we're on to pears, then we're on to gala, then we're on to jazz, then we're on to Braeburn, oh sorry, Cox in September, Bramley. So we've got a whole range of conventional varieties, not the varieties, none of those varieties, except for Ashmead kernel that Stephen showed us. So we're growing mainstream varieties. That's what the market wants. So that's another issue. What does the market want? And we, dealing with the supermarkets and the wholesale trade, we have to produce what the market wants. 
Um, so, um, and uh, Jeff, our chairman, said um, we're producing only about 30, 40% of UK demand. That is true, and we are number 31. I don't know if you could read the table he showed, but we're number 31 in the world. We're small-time producers, and uh, I may have to start mentioning the word Brexit soon, but in spite of Brexit, we're bringing in as much importing fruit as possible. So the bottom line is we're competing with high-producing countries like France and Germany, Poland, getting 60 tonnes per hectare. We're struggling because of our climate to get 30, 40 tonnes per hectare. So their prices are always low. We're always competing on the world market. Um, so, um, sorry if I'm going to moan. <laughs> I don't mean to moan. But um, the fact is, yes, and, and we're even only 20% self-sufficient in pears. So you'd think, wow, let's produce pears. There must be a huge market for it. It's not true. Belgium, the low countries, Belgium, Holland, produce wonderful, perfect pears, and it's very difficult to do that. Um, and, but we are, having said that ourselves, going more into pears, because we're finding that apples get canker, something called canker, which is a tree form of cancer, really, and, it, and it's pretty terminal. So it's costing us a lot of money, this canker. So pears aren't so vulnerable to that, so we're shifting our um, policy. Um, so what are the issues in growing top fruit on a commercial scale? And anyone considering, as I say, growing um, apples and pears, consider the sit your situation. Do not plant top fruit where you might be in a frost pocket. We have an organic farmer down, our, down the road who's got a six hectare fr uh, organic uh, fruit farm and he only gets a crop one year in five. It's an absolute disaster. He, planted in the wrong place. So think very carefully, is your site prone to uh, 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 late frosts? If it is, do not for one minute consider apples or any fruit really. Plums come into, harv into blossom earlier and they're, they're equally prone. So as uh, Nathan says, you know, he's got a very windy site. He's got to think very carefully if he's going to put uh, because you don't get pollination in a cold, windy site. So think very carefully about your microclimate. Soils, trees, surprise, uh, fruit trees, surprisingly, are very intolerant of waterlogging. So if you've got poor soils, clay, heavy soils, which are prone to waterlogging, do not consider uh, top fruit or stone fruit. Labour availability. Um, I think I can say Stephen's in a fortunate position, being where he is, in that he's, there's a lot of uh, farm, fruit, farm workers available in the autumn period, as he says. He doesn't want to be harvesting fruit in, in August when he's ha harvesting his grain. Um, the labour pool in that area is harvesting fruit and veg. Veg, sorry, isn't it? And then once they finish the veg, they can move on to... Because um, we have a, a, a casual labour force of about 30 for picking fruit. So if you've got any number of trees, it, does, it takes time to pick fruit. And you pick it into bins, you pick it into a picking bag on your uh, here, and then, it, because if you're, again, depending on your market, um, Stephen's mainly going for a juice market. So fruit bruising is not a, an issue, but if you're going for dessert fruit, you've got to pick it with kid, literally with kid, kid gloves to avoid pr bruising and damage. So labour availability and costs. Labour now is at least £13 an hour, including pension, um, employers, national insurance, holiday pay. Labour costs a lot of money, as we all know. So that is a real disincentive to a labour-intensive crop. Um, or, sorry, it means that you've really got to consider very carefully the issues. Labour is required for tree planting, pruning, thinning, picking and general tree management tying to the stake. And, um, thinning is an important issue if you want... Again, the market wants uniformity of size. It doesn't want little... Uh, we haven't got such a, a compliant um, buying public as Nathan has. They want uniform, good-looking apples. So you have to thin. You have to go out and spend money taking the apples off and dropping them on the floor. Um, pest and disease. Um, now, I'm a conventional farmer. We spray once a week. 
Um, and, but I've got a neighbour, I was speaking to a neighbouring farmer who's an uh, organic farmer. He's spraying once a week. He's spraying for, because um, any, if it's a pest or disease, apples get it. <laughs> um, for every one disease you might get in wheat, there's about 10 for apples and pears. So you're always having to spray and you're having to spray for, for fungus uh, or pest. And um, with the organic system, dare I say it, the public may be a bit more, uh, make concessions for blemishes, whereas with ordinary fruit, they make no concessions at all. <clears throat> but I don't think it's feasible. Um, we, as I say, we spray with a, an air blast spray, as it's called it, blasts the spray into the tree. <clears throat> we do that once a, once a week, once every 10 days. Organic farmers are the same. They're using copper sulfate and um, uh, potassium bicarbonate, etc., for control of mildew, scab. Um, so it's, uh, they're just using pyrethrum. They're using just different products. Um, but the type of system that I would advocate and what Stephen's practicing, you have to tolerate quite low grade outs because we, we aspire to 90% grade outs. In other words, 90% of what we pick into the bin actually ends up going out to the, to the customer. Whereas an organic grower, a commercial organic grower, will probably have 50% grade outs because the organic market is just as fussy for quality. The commercial, the, the um, supermarket organic. So, um, so if you've so the key message I'd like to get over is be in control of your marketing, like Nathan is doing, meeting the consumer, selling to the consumer. If you sell through the wholesale trade or the supermarkets, you, you're, gonna be, you're not going to be happy with the returns. So, um, and, and in general, just to go back to um, Jeff's point, um, Yes, there's a 60% of, of our fruit is imported, but please don't think that, um, you know, there's a big market out there. I want to get that over. Don't think that, because there isn't. Because we're all the time being undermined by cheap fruit coming in from Poland and Serbia even and Spain. So there's a, there's, price is the issue. We've got high energy costs now which is making, so as we speak, there's a lot of fruit being grubbed in this country. There's actually the area of apples is going down because we've taken out two hectares this year, um, which is about uh, 10%, you know, because we, orchards do have a finite life, but the economics of production are made up, bring it forward. So fruit is being taken out in spite of the fact that we're only, 30-40% self-sufficient, a lot of apples are being taken out, commercial apples. And, and uh, someone mentioned the unpredictable climate. Um, it can be too hot, too cold. Um, it, it's, it's, it's playing havoc. You know, we, we lost trees to, we thought we had proper drainage in, under drainage, and we lost trees to waterlogging. Last year we had overproduction of apples, not weight, but apples. The apples are too small, so the trees were exhausted, so we haven't got such a good crop this year. Last year we had the best ever crop of plums. This year we had 240 tonnes of plums last year. This year, 105. So it's extreme, one, one extreme to another. And the other thing is, um, again, access to cold storage. Um, if you're Apples are very prone to deterioration if they're not cooled. So uh, either you, you've got cold, your own cold stores or you, and it's got to be clean cold storage, and particularly if it's organic and you want to sell it as organic, it's got to be dedicated to be organic. So it can't be in the corner of a potato store. It's got to be dedicated to that. So um, as I say, we're spending a lot of money on electricity bringing the fruit down. Because our apple, apples and pears that we harvest now, we won't be selling them for three, four, five months. We don't know, that's the problem, it's out of our control. So we have to take it down to three, four degrees as quickly as possible. Uh, pollination has been mentioned. Um, we, we were part of a University of Bristol study and uh, they found that 80% of our pollination was done by hoverflies. Uh, we've got 24 hives on, beehives on the farm, but actually still most of the pollination is done by hoverflies. So there's lots of other pollinators besides the 
the good old honeybee. Um, and I, I wonder about, uh, I don't know the answer, how mobile the pollinators are in a big field situation if you go for agroforestry. I don't know the answer to that, and maybe in the question and answer, Stephen can give a comment on that. Um, but I, I would advise, and we're doing it on a commercial scale, planting a lot of willow around the farm, because willow, goat willow and grey willow, have a lot of pollen and nectar before the plums come in to blossom in the third week of March. So you've got to think about the, the whole biodiversity of your farm and your environment. Have you got enough wildflower, um, and preferably no oilseed rape around, because they buzz off to the oilseed rape rather than pollinate my apples. So there are issues over pollination, and we can perhaps discuss that more in the question and answer. Rootstock, um, that's both our speakers have mentioned that. Rootstock, you, you buy a, a Cox apple tree, it comes on M9. We buy it by M9 because it's a dwarfing rootstock. It'll go to about three metres. But if you want something perhaps for the organic situation, which is more uh, robust, deeper rooting, larger tree, perhaps M106 uh, or something like that. But take advice from your local tree nursery. And your local tree nursery can advise on... Uh, because scab is one of the big issues, disease, and that certainly um, marks the tree and makes the tree, uh, uh, sorry, the apple undesirable to, to look at, let alone eat. So scab is a, is a big issue, but your local tree nursery, and I can give you some names, uh, can advise on, on, on the best varieties to go for. Nearly finished, Jeff. Um, um, nothing's been mentioned about... Stephen didn't mention about managing because the understory, the, the grass, he's planted wildflower mixes as, as we do in our alleyways because we're planting on 3.5 metre alleys of trees. And um, so when we're picking, when we're doing anything, you're doing two rows at a time. A single row, it's, it's relatively expensive to go down and but not that you're spraying, but to harvest, you only can harvest on one side. We're... we're um, we, the conventional good management is to keep it weed-free, would you believe? Which I know is a bit of a heinous thing to say in the context of regenerative agriculture, but we keep it weed-free because M9 and those young trees, those trees are relatively uncompetitive with uh, grass. And um, so you can use things like MIPEX, a geotextile around the, the base of the tree to stop competition. I don't know if anyone, any of you went to the groundswell agroforestry demonstration, but they were having a big problem with weeds coming because they weren't using knapsack sprayers and herbicides, weeds coming up, up the tree. They hadn't got any weed control at all, and so their trees were struggling. Weed competition, particularly in the early years, is a, an issue to be thought about. Mulching, mypex, um, conventional or Conventional organic growers use a, some, a machine called a Laderna, which scuffles under the trees to stop weeds. But that's an expensive job. It's, it's tines, it's wear and tear, it's diesel. So I think I've covered everything. Um, but yes, uh, juice, we, we produce about 60 odd thousand bottles of juice a year. So that's adding value to our less than perfect apples. Um, so make contact with any local apple juice producers or consider going into it yourself but that's a whole another ball game you need to spend about 30,000 quid on presses and pasteurizers and bottles now have gone from 22 to 38 pence each everything's gone up but then hopefully you can pass that on to the consumer but um, that, that's a way of adding value so I'll leave it at that and we can pick things up in the question and answer thank you Thank you, Michael. That's great. If, if uh, speakers could come to the stage and we'll, we'll sit either side. Um, I should have um, shown this slide while Michael was talking. This is some shots of his farm, which is actually a fantastic farm. It really is a lovely place to be. Um, yeah, we're going to have a question and answer session now. So um, I, I've got one question to kick things off. Um, uh, just, yeah, my, my first kind of question to the panel in a way is... Um, when I started in agroforestry, um, someone told me, he said, uh, well, 
you know, the first lesson to learn about growing fruit is don't grow fruit in an orchard. Um, and that's why agroforestry is so good. Um, I, I guess the questions uh, aimed at all three, really, three of the panelists, but particularly Michael and, and Stephen in terms of the kind of context of more conventional growing. Um, I'm just interested really on, on your thoughts and whether that's affected the amount of spraying you have to do, you think, or whether it, it, it's actually viable um, as a commercial grower to grow it in crops and whether you would, you would rent out land to do that. So, yeah, I'll hand over to, to uh, Stephen first. Um, spraying, pest and disease. Uh, I, guess, I guess our, our approach was if we could have put all our trees into, let's say, one, uh, four and a half thousand trees into a, one, a four hectare block. But then that's just creating another monoculture, in my view, and, and, and a hot spot for pests and disease. So our trees are now 14 years old. We've not used a single spray in 14 years. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's, that's perfect. We still get some damage. We, we certainly get earwig damage. We certainly get some uh, pest damage from birds and insects. Um, we get a little bit of scab, um, but what we're not seeing is any um, mildew or any kind of fungal diseases because there's so much airflow through the system. Um, so we've, we, we've eliminated that, but our biggest challenge is pollination. In, in large open spaces, if it's a really cold, dry, windy spring, the pollinators don't necessarily travel all the way throughout where all the trees are. So that's been our, probably our, big, our biggest challenge. Yeah. That, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I apologise that we have to use sprays, but we, we, they are, you know, you know what I'm going to say, they're highly regulated, and we use the minimum, and we do value our biodiversity, and we actually you mentioned earwigs. We try and encourage earwigs in the pairs, because uh, earwigs are our... our friends because they go for the pear sucker nymphs and um, we've actually got bundles of bamboo canes about 12 inches long horizontally in the trees to provide a habitat for the earwigs um, so we're doing everything we can and, we, and we've actually one year we bought in some anthocorids the the ladybird type uh, uh, insects to to eat the, the rather than use sprays um, so we, we we're using the minimum of sprays but, um, you know, we do have to help nature with a little bit of uh, copper or um, potassium bicarbonate to control the mildew. Um, so, and I know, uh, particularly the people at a soil association, soil association conference will not condone sprays. I don't condone sprays. All I can say is we use the minimum. And we, um, we're no different from, I mean, the organic growers are using pyrethrum, which is a broad spectrum um, insecticide. Um, pollination is, is the interesting one um, and uh, that comes partly down back to your situation. You don't want to put it out on a highly exposed windy site. Um, but uh, touch wood, we haven't had any problems with pollination on our farm. We've got a, there's a lot of other pollinators besides honeybees. Uh, we've experimented with mason bees and uh, but so far, you know, we've always had very good pollinators, but pollinator numbers. Uh, thank you. I, I'm also, uh, so I'll talk firstly about our field scale, and then I'll just talk briefly about the issue within the uh, polytunnels. Uh, we, again, have never sprayed in all the years we've been on the farm. Um, and we're certified organic. I don't use any organic sprays either. Um, what I've found is having uh, vast biodiversity, uh, having massive beetle banks, large hedge, hedge lines, and a lot of wild areas. We, um, and by having that diversity, um, we just seem to be avoiding a lot of disease. We don't seem to have many uh, um, uh, 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 problems uh, in sex because we've, we have diversity. Um, we've got huge amounts of predators. And we've also built up great opportunities for having pollinators. And so it's really important to have those areas, those wild areas, as then I don't see them as wild, I just see them as part of the farm, part of our farming system. Uh, when you, some people would probably be horrified if they came to the end of our polytunnels. So you've got a great big 
hedge with a ditch really close to it. And then it's absolutely brambles and nettles and everything. Now, if we, we never have any aphid issues. We don't have aphid issues in our polytunnels. We used to have some aphid issues in our polytunnels uh, probably five, six years ago. And what we do then is we just go out, literally go out and find 100 ladybirds directly out there and bring them inside. We, it's, it's that kind of management. Uh, Early pollination has been an issue, certainly as I've said about uh, uh, in apricots, and that's one that we're still trying to work on. Uh, work on. But other than that, uh, we've never needed to do any spraying. And I think out on the field scale, actually for us in our situation, where we've got a very different marketplace, where I'm selling fruit when it's fresh off the tree um, for several months, and then when we're done, we're done. We don't store anything, or we store very little. We have got refrigeration on the farm, and we do do chill stuff down if we if we go uh, hold things for for slightly longer, but uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, if we can have a question in the middle there, please. Hi, uh, Andrew Walton from the Forestry Commission. Uh, this is a question for three of you. I'm just wondering if you've uh, faced any specific challenges with regards to nutrient deficiencies in your trees, and what have you done to address those? Um, we, we have been, we, we monitor uh, sort of nutrients in soils. Um, we, we know that um, uh, probably our trees are a little bit deficient in calcium and boron uh, from some, some leaf analysis. Uh, but in fairness, I've looked at the sort of economics of it. And when we're only yielding about five tonnes per hectare uh, of, of, of apples for the fruit crop. Um, I could push the trees a lot harder and probably double that, but then I'd have a load of fruit that I have to sell wholesale, and that doesn't get me out of bed in the morning because of the cost of harvesting and storage and everything else. So I'd actually rather take a slightly smaller yield from our, our fruit and capture as much value as possible um, myself and not stress the trees. So, so we know there's a bit of nutrient deficiency, but we're not actually pushing pushing yield, so I'm not actually needing to address it that much. Uh, it's a good question, and uh, we do have the soils analysed uh, every, every year for, for major nutrients, and we can put uh, micronutrients on. Uh, we have leaf analysis and sap analysis, so we know the um, micronutrient status. So but we are using fertiliser out of a bag. Um, we do mulch with green waste compost. But I've got mixed feelings about that. Everyone thinks, oh, wonderful mulching. But actually, the problem is if you put mulching on two or three inches deep, and then you are insulating it from any um, light rain benefiting the soil because the, it acts like a massive blotting paper sheet. So we, what we've ended up doing is just putting mulch on the one side of the tree down the row. Um, but good question, yeah. But we, we, there are, and then we can spray on the micronutrients. Or we can uh, something um, <coughs> we put we um, it costs we in in all part of our standard management is to put trickle irrigation in, and we can put micro um, macronutrients down through the irrigation pipe as well. Uh, for for us. Um when we planted the trees, when we started off, this is uh, outside, and also, uh, uh, so we just did this on our outside trees. We did start them, um, so they're on a vigorous root, rootstock. We started them through mypex, we let them get going, and then we just actually removed the mypex, and we grew um, a mixture of wild, Kent wild white and, uh, and yellow trefoil. Uh, we under sow essentially with a, uh, and, and some rye grass, and we have always just mowed that off, and so we've just had uh, a green manure essentially underneath that and we also run our poultry uh, so we do actually have some uh, chickens and our chickens run under underneath those in the polytunnels that's a different uh, deal so we do grow green manures in there we also make a huge amount of compost on the farm we make probably around about 80 tons of compost every year um, uh, which is our own I don't use uh, I don't use any green waste compost I also have some issues with green uh, green waste compost and the overuse of it so I tend to use that and we also uh, are now making wood chip compost 
and we're using wood chip as uh, particularly effectively underneath those trees, in those tree rows in the tunnels. And what we're finding is not only uh, a, a, a weed suppression, but we're also finding is that mycorrhizal uh, 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 relationships, which I think are really starting to benefit. And I also feel that that benefits outwards into, into our vegetable cropping. So it's quite an interesting one. A uh, question at the front here, please. Hello there, Christopher Stopes from Organic Farmers and Growers. Firstly, a great session and really interesting, inspirational. Um, but I just wanted to ask a dozen questions. No, I'm going to just confine myself to two. And it's on the uh, gross margins and the impact of labour costs, which were differently mentioned by the three speakers, three very different systems. And the other is on storage, which we've already picked up a little bit about the need for storage or not. And it depends on the system you're operating. And there are clearly three very different systems that are going on here. And it is good to get a little bit more understanding of where labour costs fit in and how the storage then also impacts on your overall gross margin. Thank you very much. <coughs> well, um, to take the storage issue, um, we're, we're producing about 500 tonnes of top fruit, apples and pears, and um, we have to store it. There's no getting away from it. it costs, it's costing a lot of money at 18 pence a unit. But uh, we have to, because, as I say, the supermarkets, the wholesale trade, won't take less than class one standard of fruit. And if you don't uh, bring it down to, well, the uh, pears we store at minus 0.5. They don't freeze if the sugars are above 11.5. So we store them at minus 0.5. Jazz Braeburn, about one to two degrees. Cox, three degrees. Um, and we grow Ashmead kernel. Um, so it's an absolute, you have to do it. And we, so we've got our own cold stores. It, there's no choice about it. Uh, we cannot, we'd love to sell it all tomorrow, but the market won't take it because the, the market is producing 300,000 tonnes of, of fruit at this time of year, and the market can only take it over a six month period. So um, there's no, we have no choice at our scale. I guess we're at the completely other end of the scale. Um, cold storage, we we only have room for about five five tons of fruit in a very small cold store. Uh, so we're <clears throat> we're more or less completely limited by cold storage, and I've chosen not to invest in that cold storage. Uh, we put the majority of our our crop into juice. So having a late harvest from sort of September October means that we can hopefully temperatures are cooling down a little bit uh, we we harvest and ship out to a, a processor who juices it for us uh, and puts it into a bottle and then we don't have to worry about storage because having seen our retail business um, uh, electricity bill, electricity bill go from one to five grand a month um, <clears throat> in the last 12 months running cold stores frightens the bejesus out of me um, and um, so, I, I, as I said earlier, I'd much rather have a smaller crop and capture the value than have a big crop with all the associated costs. And the costs, as I see it as a fruit grower, are pruning and harvesting and storage. Other than that, the trees look after themselves um, in our situation. Um, to ask you your first question, Chris, about labour, we can get labour but labour has gone from £10 an hour to £15 an hour in a heartbeat. heartbeat. And um, that's really starting us, starting us asking questions about viability in terms of labour costs and whether we have to move towards investing in uh, mechanical, mechanical harvesting. We've all, we have already moved from hand pruning to mechanical pruning uh, as the trees have got bigger. So we're now in our second season mechanical pruning. Um, and we may have to do that with harvesting. Proportion of gross margin? Um, uh, proportion of gross margin. Labour can easily soak up 20% or 25% of your, of your gross margin just in terms of cost. Uh, obviously on an incredibly different scale and slightly different routes to market, but... Um, um, Perhaps the, the most unsustainable thing about be, being a sustainable uh, farmer are the hours. Um, fortunately, um, I like to joke that uh, 
What was that Dolly Parton uh, working nine to five? I like to say I, did, I work five till nine, and then I put on a couple of hours of overtime. Um, it's um, it's pretty intense uh, um, because we've got an incredibly diverse mix system. Um, tractor lights are a fantastic invention that kill me because we find ourselves working till very very late and, and continuing, and that's just how it is. When it comes to the fruit, the fruit is just part of our of our ongoing system. So it. All of our harvest technique is essentially, it's direct sales and it's going to be directly fresh. So if we don't, uh, we essentially harvest the day before um, it, is, it, it, it goes out to the customer. And it, it, we even harvest on some of the mornings uh, p before we pack our vegetable boxes. We invested about uh, two years ago in a very large, a very large walk-in fridge, um, which has been really useful. But again, it's pretty terrifying watching the uh, watching the cost of electricity go up. Um, I would also like to say, though, that fridge is only on when it needs to be on through this period, and uh, that fridge has turned into a second. Uh, we've got a second use for it now, which is. Um, as it cools, we've got a very well thought out, very old fashioned farm where we've got a north facing hill with a barn built into the side of it where, our, where cattle would once have done very, very well. We use that as our pack house and our, our machinery barn and also our storage shed is a cool space with our chiller in it. Uh, we turn our chiller off as we hit autumn and we store our, our very uh, delicate uh, winter squashes and we end up with 5,000 winter squashes in the slightly insulated space. And the fruit is long gone. It's a memory at that point. Um, it's been sold directly. Um, Labour is a massive issue to us because where we are, we don't have that many people that are looking for that kind of intense work. And uh, we, well, we just don't have that many people, full stop. Uh, so uh, it's quite hard. Uh, we should have had more children. <laughs> Stephen at, at the front. Uh, so absolutely fantastic talks. Learned so much. Absolutely incredible. So thank you to all of you. I just want to make some observations and hope the panel and the other people in the room might comment. So I've travelled up from Kent. The first observation is there are only three insects splatted on my windscreen. There was a million pound wiped off the gala apple crop in Kent because of lack of pollination. Nearly all of the big... I work a lot for the big fruit growers in Kent and also for the major corporates that are involved in the procurement of apples and pears, both for the cider industry and for the other industries. Very interested in your word commercial. So nearly ev all of the big growers I know are moving rapidly out of apples and pears in Kent. They're actually growing wine. That's the future for them. Um, so is it actually a sensible return on capital today to invest in top fruit? You know, we're looking at PepsiCo, inv we're investing 20,000 hectare establishment. Um, so is, is that model that you're operating commercial, really? You know, if you take into account the invest, return on investment and you remove the tax advantages. Uh, absolutely. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm very much questioning it. That's why we've taken apples out. Um, the, the pears, when they yield, are, uh, are profitable. Plums are profitable but we are questioning our business strategy. I mean, but it's all changed with, with Brexit, with labor going up, with energy costs going up. The e economics of fruit production have really, I mean, up until, I don't know, 2019, it was very rosy, it was very profitable. It, we had a viable business, but we are seriously uh, reviewing our strategy at present. Um, it's, there's so many factors beyond our control, not least uh, the weather. Um, pollination, uh, I hadn't heard that statistic, but I mean, I think part of the poor crop this year in fruit production is uh, fruit trees had such a good, they were carrying such a load last year, uh, we've got a lot of bare uh, trees not bearing any fruit at all, particularly in the jazz. So, um, you know, but we, that's a seasonal issue. But no, there is a, there is a fun, I mean, and, and I, um, going back to um, Jeff's first slide, uh, we're going to slip down the, the, the league table of fruit production without a doubt. 
and as I go, come back, I use the word commercial because we are trying to be commercial. Um, we are facing big competition. There's no, for the fifth time, this government have not put in um, Brexit things that they promised they would do to uh, inspect imports of, of fruit. So fruit is coming in and we can't compete with it. They're getting 60 tonnes to the hectare, we're getting 30, 35, 40 tonnes to the hectare. And, and uh, we're, 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 we can't compete. So you're going to see less English fruit, British fruit in the, in the, in the supermarkets, I'm afraid. Um, so thank you for that. <laughs> Um, I'd just like to say that I do consider myself a commercial grower as well. Uh, it is my business, um, but, I, um, but obviously on a very different scale. So firstly, it is, it's not a hobby. I have to make this work. I have a huge uh, farm loan that we uh, managed to pay off. We're a profitable farm, um, but I'm a food producer. I produce a diverse range of, of crops. It's not just fruit, so it all fits in together. I'm finding that actually direct sales has been brilliant for us. It's really hard work. We do a huge amount of hours. There's every part of it I really enjoy because not only do we produce the food, we know the people who eat it. And I've never per met anyone that doesn't eat. So this is this great opportunity to, uh, uh, to connect directly with those people. And I have no problem selling everything. In fact, if I doubled the size of my farm and carried on the method that I'm farming, I could probably sell everything. And I think that actually that was what I am particularly interested in seeing, is actually seeing smaller units, mixed horticultural units. Um, I think there's scale for everything. I think there's scale for everything. I think there's lots of room for one and two acre salad producers and, and working on small scale horticulture. But I think there's a huge amount of room for 20, 20 30 acre farms, which are in mixed production and including fruit into that. And I think being able to directly engage with your customer, you're able to directly engage with talking about seasonal eating and saying, look, taste this. This is great. I can give you a slice of this apple. I can give you a taste of this peach. I can show you what a kohlrabi does and I can do all of those things. It works for us. Thank you, Nathan. If I could just have a closing comment from all the panellists. It's been a fantastic session. I'd just like to say a huge thank you to you all. Um, and if we just have a very quick closing comment from each person, that would be great. Thank you. Mine's not going to be a quick closing comment because I wanted to answer that question as well. Um, so it will be quick but slightly rambling. Um, we have to be commercial. My landlord's just presented me with a 16% increase in rent from next month. So we have to be commercial. It has to be viable. Um, bear in mind our agroforestry is delivering not only a fruit crop, it's delivering uh, biodiversity, it's delivering landscape, soil protection, water quality protection. So there's an economic value to those. There is a huge opportunity here when we're talking about polycultural systems and viability, commercial viability. He's gone now. He's asked the question. Um, um, about stacking people in enterprises. There's a massive opportunity for someone in this room to partner who wants to grow fruit to partner with someone who's got land and grow the fruit in an agroforestry context on their land and have two viable our businesses working together. So think about stacking enterprises to build resilience and build viability, commercial viability because you're bringing people and skills and finance together to do that rather than trying to do everything yourself. It's a huge opportunity. So my parting comment is how can we bring, how, how can we stack enterprises, how can we stack things in time and in space and in viability to bring that diversity, because that diversity brings resilience economically and against some of the climate challenges we've got. Well, so our, our strategy is, is to be done more diverse in our outlets. So our, our farm shop is do, in the last two, two years is doing much better. And um, we're doing much better on the juice. So we're adding value to the, to the apples. Um, last year we had poor grade outs, I admit it, because of the drought and uh, 
So we've, we've got a, it's attention to detail, which is you, some might say is just tinkering at the edges. Fundamentally, structurally, the industry is, is facing a very difficult future. Our, my industry, at a, at a, 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 a um, specialised level, it's facing. I don't know whether we're we're, we're going to see. You know, only 90% of the apple crop is going to be taken out at this rate. Um, and only the big, really good producers who can produce 60 tonnes to the hectare will survive. Um, and there are some on brick earth soils who are doing that, but I'm afraid uh, it's a struggle. So I, I don't want to be pessimistic. I, th I think what Nathan and, and Stephen are doing is the right answer, is direct selling, adding value, um, and, and don't get into my business for one minute. Uh, so. Uh, I think that's more, I can't say more than that. I just go very quickly say that um, I, I try to be led by, you may have noticed a, a, a slide on, we paint it on our barn door, it reminds me every day, it says ecology now. I'm led by the ecology. I think we've got to think about soil all of the time as, as the leader on everything, about the wider ecology. And then trust our businesses that if we, if we take a, care of ecology that our businesses will actually flourish within that and that takes into account human ecology as well and I, I think that's what leads me and keeps me going and it seems to work thank you thank you panel it's been absolutely amazing <laughs> uh, thank you for coming all this way and uh, yeah I'll let you go into your other sessions thank you very much thank you for listening We'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Sainsbury's, and our other major sponsors, Farmers Weekly Transition, Forestry Commission, and Till Hill, and all the attendees for making this show such an overwhelming success. To get advice and support for your agroforestry project, either visit woodlandtrust.org.uk forward slash plant or soilassociation.org forward slash agroforestry.